Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. On this week's episode, we've got three different regionals that happened around the world that we've got to talk about the results of, and they will definitely surprise you. Very unexpected results. We'll be covering that, of course. We will also have Guess That Flavor Text, everyone's favorite segment of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. And then we'll talk a little bit about the world's qualification championship point bar is it a little too high that's a little bit of a discussion that has been going on early this week on twitter in the pokemon community so we want to talk about it is the bar a little too high is it too difficult for worlds is it too difficult for pokemon's most prestigious event we'll give our thoughts here shortly my name of course is chip Ritchie, and i am joined as always by my co-host and friend coming off of a top 16 finish Azul GG, what's up Azul, how's it going, and congratulations, top 16, two weeks in a row, maybe you'll make it back into top cut one day. Yeah, hopefully you squeak back into another top eight. I mean, we have, once again, top 16, uh, which is like my third or fourth on the season now, so still being consistent, and I still feel like I'm achieving my goal of putting myself in a spot to like top eight uh, every event, got to the winning in on the top eight this time around. So if I can just keep doing that, I'm, I'm still content with my finishes and like, it does make it worth it, you know, getting a, a top 16 finish, like in terms of potential, you know, end of your championship points for the top 16 race. And then I've already achieved my invite. I guess I didn't mention that on the podcast last week. I do have my invite as of LAIC. So if I wanted to, you know, stop playing Pokemon <laughs> right now and just show up at the world championships, I could, but I think I'm gonna still continue to go to most of the, events and you know try and go for that top 16 spot at the end of the year the day two spot which is gonna be hard though because i plan to not play in any local events when they do make their way back next year i plan no to go to cups. zero cups zero zero cups zero challenges but we'll see maybe i can do it with bro, the uh, san fran locals consistent. want to meet you bro the bay area they need to see azul out at the locals no you won't catch me at uh, any locals i don't plan to do any of that um but yeah played the played the lost box kyogre again um there wasn't a big there wasn't a ton of time uh, in the turnaround between LAIC and Toronto. Uh, it was cool to see so many people get so creative. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later with all the results, of course. So it was cool to see a lot of creativity um, still come out of the game, despite Lugia being so dominant and definitely still being, I think. I don't think anyone questions Lugia is still like the S tier, you know, number one it deck still. It is still the best but... deck in the format, yes. Yeah. And people, even everything people that, may uh... question it, but they definitely shouldn't. Lugia is yeah. still the best deck in the format, <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, and if you look at like, you if you look at the stuff that people came up with to beat Lugia, Lugia can t easily tech for all of it. Like, there's not a question of, oh, how does Lugia handle this new problem? It's like, okay, they handle it like this, right? Um, um, so yeah, change change a couple things about the Kyogre list as well. Uh, cut the Raikou, and the Raikou was kind of like that. I think is the biggest change that people will probably notice from the list from LAIC that me I've and my got, crew uh, played. Caleb's to, uh... tweet pulled up here on the YouTube video for people to see where Caleb Caleb oh, laid yeah. out exactly what the seven different changes were that you made yeah definitely swapping the lightning attackers is the first thing that stands out i'm sure to most people yeah so we cut the raikou the, the raikou was kind of a last minute addition at laic just to be like well we just want something to be so we have the option of being aggressive um especially because like <laughs> in our testing the night before laic happened uh dan was turn one in us uh with raikou in the lugia matchup so we we're like all right it probably seemed a little bit better than it actually was when you're attacking turn one with raikou and i actually did that to reagan on at laic in one of the later rounds in day two they went first took attached to lugia pass and i was like all right i looked at my hand it had colrus uh, pokey stop vacuum and i'm like all right that's a turn one raikou and then i turn one raikou on that seven turn. energy um, in the lost zone turn one or seven cards seven in the lost cards, zone turn yeah. one if you have the Pokestop plus Vacuum, it's actually not that hard. But you basically need yeah those those two cards to do a turn one. Like that's like that's like the how you do a turn one. Um, but yeah, made a couple changes. Like I said, no Raikou. Uh, put in a Bird Keeper over a Clara. Change up the energy, of course, a little bit because we're now all of a sudden playing the Zekrom, which requires two Lightning energy and is like a big uh, big player in the lugia matchup um it requires more energy and it's something you want to have the option of using multiple times potentially against lugia with the uh the paralysis attack so uh and then the bird yeah bird keeper over clara bird keeper is basically the closest thing to a fifth colrus besides playing like pokey gear to just see your colrus more often but games last more than four turns so having a fifth supporter kind of makes sense uh and bird keeper uh 
is the closest thing to a fifth course because it allows you to use more comfies, which yeah. leads to more cards in your lost zone. So the bird keeper was kind of the, uh, the supporter we went with over the Clar because the Clar is not very good to be honest. At LAIC, it was pretty mid. Uh, it was good when you're using a lot of save lives, but that's about it. But yeah, that's that's my weekend. Uh, top sixteen again. Uh, still feeling good about the run, and then uh, yeah, looking forward towards the next tournament in Dallas in a couple weeks. Uh, but how was your weekend chip over in Toronto? You were doing the the uh, what was even the official name of the, the there is not an official section. name <laughs> <laughs> no official name just yet but yes i was in toronto as well but i was working the event uh on the production side of things so normally i cast these regionals but i was not a caster this time i was kind of like a host an analyst for the show something along those lines we had a little bit of a set set up backstage where there was a bunch of chairs, a, a fake brick wall. Andrew was making a joke whenever I was interviewing him. Uh, Andrew Mahone, he was like, yeah, I feel right at home. Brick wall, the ferns. The... <laughs> <laughs> it felt just like his studio back at home. But um, but yeah, it was really cool. So I, I uh, ran that area, pulled in players for interviews throughout the tournament. We interviewed a judge. We kind of did a little show where we like showed off all the swag that players get for coming to tournaments. We just tried, it was, it's really an area to fill extra time between rounds because that's always been an issue with the TCG, especially when we have games that complete on stream in less than 50 minutes. Right. Because yeah. the rest of the tournament is still going on. Like we had one stream game round six, I think round five or six that literally was 20 minutes long and the game was over. And then all of a sudden we have, at least 40 minutes before the next round even gets paired. So it's like, we got to fill that time with something. And that's where that's kind of what the function of this space was meant to be. I'm going to try to pull up some pictures to show um, about it. But yeah, it was really fun. I did miss casting, um, but I do think it added a lot to the viewing experience. And that's kind of the hope is that something like this can exist that will keep people as, entertained and as interested in you know continuing to watch the stream as possible so yeah i found a couple pictures i can share here that katie tweeted out so people can get kind of an idea but i'd love to hear anyone's feedback uh listening to the cast here on the youtube channel if you want to drop a comment down below if you watched the stream you saw any of this segment let me let us know what you think about it ways that you think it could be better because ultimately the the live stream show is for the community so we want to hear community feedback, ways that they think it can be improved because the show is for the Pokemon fans out there, right? So yeah, yeah. it's definitely cool to see it to get kind of a bigger uh, space and kind of everything. Because like leading up to this one, the last couple of events, they just had like the little uh, interview uh, corner <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, where people did the interviews. Um, but now you have like the whole setup which is pretty sick. And that's what I always said, like the next thing to kind of add to Pokemon streams is kind of like an analyst desk. And there was kind of something like that at Worlds, right? Like, um, I forget who was hosting that. Aaron was hosting that, right? Yeah. Um, and that was kind of for all all the games, though, right? It was kind of like a space just to kind of talk about Worlds in general, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but they um, had the ability to do like playback for VGC to like show okay. things that had happened. And I think that they want to do that. In the future, I think there's some logistical things getting figured out there, but stay tuned. Maybe that's something that'll happen in the future. But I think that would be a, uh, that's a natural way to continue to improve this space is for us to fill some of that dead time to be able to pull from the last match that just happened and talk about the key moments. Yeah, and that, the, I guess like the next thing after that would be like you know analyst segment after each match, um, as well as alongside the interviews to fill times. And then uh, one thing that I've kind of saw develop, like well, I remember like in League of Legends was eventually they have someone with like a teleprompter, like a weatherman kind of setup where there's a guy next to like a big a big screen and he's just like pointing out specific plays going on and like why this happened and where were the big pivotal moments. So that's like the next, I can imagine weatherman, weatherman ship up there with a huge <laughs> screen behind him, drawing little circles and stuff and be like, here's yeah. where he top decked and then boom, put the energy on the act and that's it. That was game. They did that at Worlds one year. They had that oh, exact really? thing. Yeah, they had a, a weatherman board. There's a funny uh, meme for from Cybertron for VGC where he was like, yeah, welcome back, everyone. Because his intro to his YouTube videos is like Aaron Cybertron Zhang here, because that's his screen name. And he yeah. said, Aaron Weatherman Zhang here, because <laughs> that's what he I didn't was know that. Doing. Yeah. yeah, it was a few years ago. I don't know exactly what happened with it. I don't know. I think a lot of things got kind of jumbled up with like a two year break and like new people came on to the production crew. And so like, I don't know. I think some of the ideas that had existed maybe 
got pushed back because maybe they didn't work the best in the way that the people who were there previously intended it. Whatever reason, I think some of those things will be coming back, though. So I'm excited about it. But yeah. it's going to be a little while before I get to see any of those things implemented because I'm actually not going to be um, a part of the production in Arlington. I'm not going to be casting, not going to be doing the analyst section, anything like that. I'm actually going to be playing at Arlington Regionals, which I'm super excited about. I have not played at a regional championships since the fall of 2019, the Atlantic City Regionals, which was a regionals that you won, Azul. Yep. So was that the last regionals you won as well? So I maybe maybe so, it's yeah. a good omen for you that I'm coming back <laughs> maybe. to play. The last regionals I played in, you won the tournament. So I, I'm definitely that. looking forward to it. Azul and the crew has uh, kindly allowed me to come into the fray and I'm going to try to be testing with them the next couple weeks and hopefully we can come up with something sick to uh, play for the tournament. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, chips or well, this might be like your this could be your first well not your first your last re this could be your last regional ever potentially right your last regional you ever play in I yeah mean, i mean cast I a know. ton of them could continue to cast a ton of them um <clears throat> yeah i, I this think could be the uh, last one uh, my my preference will pretty much always be to cast i do love getting to do it um there's a lot of people mm -hmm. on the casting team now and i so i think that probably what happened here is they're just trying to cycle through and get everyone some work right yeah because it's all like a contract gig so they're trying to get everyone work so um i did not get the call for for dallas but that did give me the opportunity to come and play which i'm excited about yeah yeah <clears throat> so yeah it'll be exciting to get you back in there chip no no uh was gonna say no mega ray but um <laughs> i'm sure we can <laughs> i'm sure you'll be fine that's fine bro that's fine <laughs> That right, Mega Ray so, uh, did bring me my one top eight at a regionals ever, but yeah. I've I've made day two with other decks. Okay, we'll <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Um, speaking of tournaments, though, yeah, we three happened this weekend. So there's a ton of tournaments. Um, I think we actually we were like we actually remembered all of them last week to like mention all of them because <laughs> usually we forget when there's so many happening at the same time. I feel like we usually forget. Of course, we're in North America, so we always remember those. We always know about those coming up. Um, but sometimes we forget one or two. But we remembered all of them last week, and we are looking at the results of all of them this week. Uh, Brisbane Regionals, Stuttgart Regionals, and Toronto Regionals that me and Chip were at. Um, so we're going to take a look at Brisbane first. And this was probably the – well, this one happened first. Like, its top eight happened first um, yeah. before before day two even, like, started for us in Toronto. Brisbane's top eight, I think, was already kind of established. And uh, it was a wild top eight. In the top eight, there was a Inteleon – uh, water box Articuno deck. There was a Zekrom Flaffy box. There was a Durant. There was a uh, two controls, two Lugias, and a Mew. So a little bit more normal there. But none of those were in top four. The top four was all the craziness. Uh, so which <laughs> what do you want to look at first here, Chip? There was a whole bunch of stuff here in Brisbane. Yeah, this was wild for sure. And I think we should start the conversation here with what people's expectations were coming into this weekend, right? Because even mm. us. On the cast last week, we talked about how Lugia was just going to dominate all these tournaments. And that's really what the discussion was on Twitter as well, is like, is there any stopping Lugia? And I think we probably just all collectively as a community got a little ahead of ourselves. Lugia is still definitely the best deck. We already said that. But there, uh, if someone... If people were able to look at the lists from LAIC and find ways to take advantage of how the majority of Lugia players were building their decks. And that is the strategies that we saw kind of come out and do really well. And we can start by looking, I guess, at the deck that did win in Brisbane by Tim Franklin, whose name on Twitter, I believe, is Tim Danklin. So shouts out to Tim <laughs> Danklin for getting the win with Intellium Frostmoth, we actually did see Charlie Lockyer making top eight in Toronto with a pretty similar deck. He did not play Frostmoth or the Alolan Vulpix V-Star that Tim has, but the main strategy here is revolving around this Articuno. Yeah, so the Articuno with the Wild Freeze. And actually, the leading up to the tournament, uh, tournaments this weekend, uh, the only I had like I was able to stream like twice before the tournament. And the last stream I had, I was playing a Palkia deck with Articuno in it because there, some had done well at um, LAIC. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to give this a shot. Let's see how good this Articuno actually is into Lugia. And I like went undefeated against Lugia on the ladder. Like they never had a chance. 
the Articuno 110 HP. It's got the Ice Wing for one water energy for 20, which you're never going to use. You're using that Wild Freeze for 70. This Pokemon does, you know, 50 damage to yourself, and then your opponent's active Pokemon is now paralyzed, which is a big deal because the most popular deck in the format, Lugia, doesn't really have a good way to deal with paralysis. And I think the biggest thing here as well, another big thing here is that the Articuno doesn't really knock anything out in the Lugia deck. Like Wild Freeze is almost never KOing something or even two hit KOing something. So you get like time to sit there and Wild Freeze and kind of trap something in the active while you set up to knock it out with quick shooting um, or set up your board state in a way where you can kind of, you know, get super far ahead and play towards like winning the prize trade at some point. Uh, and then the, the other card that combos me with this card to make it even that much more annoying is the Emergency Jelly, uh, which is a tool card which says at the end of your turn, if this Pokemon, if the Pokemon this card is attached to has 30 HP or less, heal 120 damage from it, and then you discard the Emergency Jelly. And this list actually plays two Emergency Jelly. So theoretically, you attack with Articuno twice, you have 100 damage on yourself, you attach your Emergency Jelly on the second attack to your Articuno. The Emergency Jelly heals you from 100 damage to full HP, and then you discard it, and you could attach another Emergency Jelly two turns from then, um, but your Articuno is sitting there in the active using Wild Freeze over and over and over again continuously um, while you're getting the knockouts with the quick shooting, so your opponent never actually gets to attack. You kind of just like chain lock them with the Wild Freeze. So really cool way to kind of uh, take advantage of the way that Lugia decks are being built. Yeah, and this goes back to what you mentioned kind of at the top of this of how Lugia can pretty reasonably adapt to this, yeah. right? You know, Lugia can play switch cards. <laughs> it, it's yeah, a pretty straightforward way to solve this. Paralysis is the best status condition in the game. It is the only status condition that guarantees your opponent can't attack. You know, sleep, you can flip heads to wake up. Confusion, you can flip heads through the confusion. Burn and paralysis, or burn and poison, just add damage counters. But paralysis can guaranteed buy you a turn unless your opponent plays an actual switching card to get out of it or some way to heal the paralysis. There are things like that that exist in the format as well. Pokemon Center Lady, um, you know, there, there's, there's ways that, you know, people could adjust. I even saw someone tweeting out like full heal and <laughs> um, <laughs> Lumberry is like tool cards that you could play in Lugia to counter this. Um, I think that Switch or Bird Keeper are probably the cards that make the most sense. And we did see some players in their Lugia decks this weekend already adjusting to this kind of anticipated meta change. Um, I think a lot of people who wanted to play Lugia expected things like Articuno and Zekrom to be on the rise. You know, we did see the Articuno in a few places. Obviously, your crew played the Zekrom in their Lost mm -hmm. Box deck. So those are kind of just two natural ways to try to deal with Lugia. So Lugia was already, you know, some of the lists that did do well this weekend were playing Bird Keeper or the Espeon VMAX, which we'll talk about um, in just a little bit. But I think, you know, we'll continue on looking at Brisbane. But while we're on this Intellium Frostmoth deck, let's go ahead and talk about Charlie Lockyer's deck that he got yep. top eight with because it is really similar. There's no Frostmoth, no Alolan Vulpix V-Star, but his was really cool, and he got streamed, I think, in round four. So if you really want to see this strategy play out pretty much to a T, um, Charlie had a, I think, a five-to-one prize card deficit, but he got his board set up, got the Articuno <laughs> attacking, and he has the Radiant Alakazam and the quick shooting Intellion in here to move the damage counters around. And pretty much what he was able to do was manipulate the damage in play so that he never knocked out his opponent's active Pokemon, that he could just keep it locked up, paralyzed, and then moved damage to the bench in order to KO Pokemon on the bench to take his prizes and make the full comeback. Yeah, so this one is definitely way more built. Both, I guess I like another thing to mention. Both play the SQ plus Wash Energy. That's kind of your win condition. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's your win condition against Lost Box decks is SQ plus Wash. Put the it's Wash on the Ice SQ. Again, the I put put the Wash Energy on the Ice Q, <laughs> and then Ice Q uses the attack Block Face, which is seventy damage, uh, and then your opponent's next turn prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from you from basic Pokemon. So Wash Energy stops Sableye, and the attack stops damage from basic Pokemon. So that's your win condition up against the Lost Box decks. Otherwise, you would just kind of lose the Lost Box. Gives so many. I mean, Italian decks have always struggled against Lost Box decks. Lost Box decks in general, but Ice Q is your win con there. Um, and then yeah, the I guess like yeah, the Volpix was interesting from uh, the other 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 difference with the Volpix, like you mentioned. I guess we can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, uh, Charlie's build way more about just abusing Articuno, right? Three Articuno, three Emergency Jelly, and then the Radiant Alakazam, uh, which is a super sick Radiant Pokemon. It's got that spoon spoonful of pains, uh, sp 
painful spoons. Wow. Uh, painful spoons ability. Once on your turn, the you may move two hurting, damage counters. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once on your turn, you may move two damage counters from one of your opponent's Pokemon to another of your opponent's Pokemon. So whenever you have like excess damage built up on the active and you don't want to knock out their active through an attack from the uh, from the Articuno, you can start to move the damage off that active Pokemon or even manipulate the damage on the bench that you've built up through uh, previous Alakazam damage to kind of prep yourself for once you quick shooting their active, they're going to send up this. So when I wild freeze that, I don't want to KO it. So I can, you know, painful spoon some damage around uh, and make sure that they're kind of infinitely trapped with the Articuno. Uh, and then this, the Charlie deck also plays two Drapion as kind of their, their mute answer. But once again, yeah, another uh, deck abusing the paralysis, uh, a little bit different no frost moth just kind of all in on the articuno has the raihans for the energy acceleration so your turn one's looking like keep calling and then turn two articuno plus raihan start attacking i'm sure is the way your kind of game plan for most of your games yeah very cool one i definitely uh thought this was one of my favorite decks that we saw on the stream through the weekend i think that part of the reason it was so good too is that in charlie's stream game he just he played against a standard lugia list so he got to like display the strategy of the deck perfectly exactly why he wanted to uh wanted to bring it to the tournament so uh yeah let's go back over to tim's list though the alolan vulpix v star we have uh, talked about alolan vulpix on the cast before when silver tempest came out not a card that either of us is a huge fan of um but i guess like as a one one line it can make sense in like the exact right circumstance it can become a wall that your opponent is going to have a really tough time getting through yeah i guess yeah it's got the what the Snow, snow, mirage. snow mirage 160 damage and you're, during your opponent's next uh oro it's first off it's a shred it has shred so it gets through any effects on your opponent's active pokemon uh, and then during your opponent's next turn prevent all damage done to this pokemon by attacks from your opponent's pokemon that have an ability uh so i'm just not sure where this is like super useful i like it's pretty good against lost box most of the time but you have the ice skew plus the wash energy for that so i'm not sure when this vulpix is like seen play i just don't know what matchup you're using this in of course it's not just bad to have right even against certain lugia board states lugia won't have an answer for uh the vulpix right like vulpix plus wash attacking into lugia it maybe once the evil tall, with, if, if once evil tall goes down there's not no. really a great way for lugia to deal with vulpix right well if you have the wash energy that stops the evil tall right I mean, yeah, they have, too, they, have too. they have Lugia V. They can just hit you with Lugia V. They just don't have to evolve. That's true, <laughs> the, but it's like going to be a two hit KO setup there, right? Yeah. So it like gives you so, time to adjust to it, and also, uh, this is like the V Star power of the deck too. And its V Star yeah. power is not bad. It, it can one hit KO stuff. I imagine this is probably decent in the Mew matchup, right? Because you can yeah. just, just guaranteed it's pretty much like a Drapion <laughs> without being a Drapion. And this deck also does play a Drapion, so that's probably because the like strategy attack. in that matchup is you put Drapion plus a Lolan Vulpix V in play. Yeah. And then there you go. That's like <laughs> that's pretty good. That's gonna be tough for you to deal with. Yeah, maybe that's the thought process there. Instead of playing two Drapion, you play the one one Vulpix have a little bit more versatility and utility in other matchups. Sure. Plus one Drapion. Um yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan. I think I'm definitely a bigger fan of. Like, if I compare the two lists, I think I like Charlie's a little bit better. Um, this one is definitely cooler because it's got more stuff. It's got the Frost Moth in there, and we've seen Frost Moth box boxes before, uh, early on yeah. last format before last, like be a thing. Um, but then kind of Lost Zone, uh, Lost Zone decks kind of took them out of the format a little bit. But we'll be making a comeback with uh, this build. But yeah, I, I definitely I think if I'm comparing the two lists, I like Charlie's a little bit better because I feel like they kind of do the same thing. I feel like Charlie's list is just a little bit more, by being more straightforward, it's just going to be more consistent. Yeah, I will say, though, that I think Charlie's list is better into, like, the heavy Lugia with no switch card meta, but we're moving away from that. So, like, moving forward, like, I think for this weekend, I definitely like Charlie's list a little bit more. But I yeah. think moving forward, I would almost want, if you wanted to play something similar to this, I feel like pivoting to what Tim won with is probably a little better, honestly. Yeah, that's possible. I could see it for sure. Yeah, I could see it. I don't know. I don't know, though, because I feel like the meta's not that wide open, to be honest. I don't know. But I guess if you're going to be running into other shenanigan decks, like if you're running into these other Kunos or the next deck we could probably talk about here, which is another Paralysis deck that got second at uh, Brisbane, stuff like the Flaffy Box, I guess having a little bit more versatility of stuff, uh, like the Greninja that Tim had, or like the uh, like the Alolan Vulpix, you know, you're going to be able to handle more random stuff more easily, right? Yeah, so this Flaffy box is definitely really cool. It's got a 4-4 line of the Flaffy in here with that Dynamotor ability, an iconic ability at this point for sure. This 
energy acceleration ability has existed in the game. I think all the way back since like 2003, 2004, that time frame with the original Blaziken from Ruby and Sapphire. But yeah, Dynamotor, once during your turn, you may attach a lightning energy card from your discard pile to one of your benched Pokemon. And to complement the Flaffy, there's just a ton of different lightning attackers, a ton of different just attackers in general as well. We've got the one Zekrom, which is the same one that you played in your Lost Box deck. Wild yep. Shock, 160. This Pokemon also does six damage to itself. Your opponent's active is now paralyzed. 130. Yeah, 130. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was already <laughs> throwing the choice belt on there. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've got the Regieleki. It does 120 damage. Discard all lightning from this Pokemon. It does 40 to two of your opponent's bench Pokemon, so that's a good attacking option. We've got the Snorlax, which you know has been a pretty solid attacker ever since Lost Origin came out. Zapdos from Pokemon Go is a way to boost your lightning attacker's damage output. The math does line up pretty nicely for Zapdos plus Zekrom to one-hit KO Lugia, right? It puts you to that 140 times 2 is the 280 yep. if they don't have Dunsparce down. And there's also some other cute things in here, the Raikou and that Metacham V. And there's definitely some cute combos you can set up with the Zekrom plus Metacham. Yeah, so the Zekrom, specifically into the Lugia matchup, you're hitting for 130, which is 260. You do 260 damage. Uh, you paralyze the Lugia. They have 20 HP left. And then this is specifically, uh, you got a decent amount of switch cards in here with the, the ropes and the balloons. But you also have three scoop up nets. So you can pretty easily maneuver your bench into a way where you can get the Metacham in play, get into the active, uh, and then use that yoga loop on the uh, Lugia. And then you'll get kind of like a, you get to attack again on the next turn. And then you just get super far ahead with the yoga loop combo. Um, and then you do have the Metacham in play at that point, so this is something you want to be using when you know for sure your opponent can't just win by KOing the Metacham after you have your, like, two turns of play, but, uh, yeah, it allows you to get pretty far ahead. Um, I'm actually, I thought there was Emergency Jellies in this build as well, but I guess there, there's not. <laughs> but this deck, actually, the more I thought about it as I looked at it, it kind of makes sense. Like, why would you want Emergency Jelly? You're either one-hit KOing their Lugia, or you're trapping in the active thing using Metacham later, so you don't really need it at all, to be honest. Yeah, so actually... It's not actually that big of a deal that it's not um, not there. But yeah, another paralysis deck, taking advantage of the way that people were kind of playing and building their Lugia decks. Even if they have Dunsparce, uh, you're probably still going to win with this deck up against Lugia because you'll use Zekrom twice. It'll trap the Lugia in the active. You Metacham from there, and then you get like another turn to work with after that where you can kind of do uh, whatever you want. And you got a couple of different attackers in here like the Snorlax, like the Reggie Lucky. Uh, so you're not just beating Lugia. You have some decent versatility for some other matchups as well, and you're not just kind of folding to the, the Lugia. I will say, though, um, your Lost Box matchup has to be pretty tough with a deck like this, I feel. Uh, maybe that's where the Snorlax has kind of come in as your your heavy hitter for that matchup so, to give you yeah. a chance. Um, but I'm a little bit scared of the Snorlax kind of getting stuck in the active and staying asleep. Like, Sable, I just going to ping KO your Flaffy. Uh, <laughs> even if you have, like, the net to reset your Snorlax, you don't have enough Flaffies in play anymore to, like, reset it up, and then you're just kind of stuck from there. It feels like that definitely could happen. So I feel like the Lost Box matchup for this deck probably pretty tough, but that's not why you play it. You play it because look, it was by far the most popular deck at every tournament uh, over the weekend, I'm sure, uh, and that's what you took advantage of with uh, playing something like this Flaffy Box. Yeah, I think there's definitely things you can do in that Lost Box matchup, though, uh, specifically with the Metacham, right? There's a lot of different numbers that you can hit, like Zekrom 130 into a Snorlax, then Metacham, Yoga Loop, 20 more. Oh, wait, no, Snorlax can't be Yoga Looped, can it? That's uh, true, yep, no. Yeah, <laughs> never mind, it doesn't work, forget it. <laughs> and you're going to have you're gonna have the bench protection from Manaphy, so like Reggie Lucky yeah. can't even like get too far ahead or anything. So the Lost Box matchup, and I, th I think Lost Box is going to become a more popular deck for sure. Uh, moving forwards because i think it holds its own against lugia just fine and then such a versatile deck right so many options so many different ways to play it so um the flappy box i think unfortunately will struggle going forwards because it doesn't have something like the ice cube to kind of just be uh uh was it catch all or something in the in the lost zone matchups and it also probably doesn't like playing against ice cube for what that's worth too <laughs> we gotta attack yeah. with flappy <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got the electro ball um, I actually knew someone who played control, played just Sanders 60 control list at Toronto, and they hit a Flaffy box uh, at Toronto. And they were like, yeah, I just started attacking with SQ, and they started had to attack with Flaffy, but like it just takes them so long to KO my SQ because <laughs> he's got yeah. a cape on him and everything. So, yeah, yeah this, this, this deck is probably not a huge fan of, uh, huge fan of the SQ for sure. 
And then one more kind of wild deck in top four. I mean, first off, Lewis Stevens was in here with the Evil Tall Control. So, like, you know, the fact that a Control was up there. There's no Lugia, no Mew in the top four. Evil Tall Control. And then second and first place were the Flaffy Box and the Intellion. And then third place was Anthony Fernie with the Durant, which is definitely, I think, of everything that happened this weekend, this is probably the biggest, like, wild card to me of a deck that, like, I mean... The Intellion box is kind of wild. The Flaffy box is kind of wild, sure. But, like, we've seen those decks a little bit in the past. The Durant, though, even though it's, like, kind of existed, not really very often in this form in a uh, in a competitive sense. So really uh, cool to see from Anthony getting top four with the Durant. Yeah, actually kind of a, a funny story about this. I actually had a co- coaching session with Anthony um, a couple months ago, um, kind of prepping or, or wanted to go over some just kind of general deck building stuff around Durant prepping for Brisbane regionals. Um, and the big question was like, should I just not play this deck? Just tell me if I should just not play this deck. And I, I just won't play it. And I was like, I never like to tell people to not work on a deck or not play a deck because you want to be the first person. The, 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 the thing I think I actually said to them is like, you want to be the first person to top eight a regional with Durant. Uh, <laughs> you want to be the first person to, you know, um, the example I usually give is like, you want it to be like the example I give was like back when Mew first came out, you want it to be the first person playing the turbo build of Mew with the Elsa Sparkle and Meloetta because no one was playing that to begin with. Um, so you should really, you should always invest time to try new ideas and new things out. Uh, but then you just have to know when to kind of put it down. You don't want to waste time either, right? You don't have so much time to try so many new things. So you don't want to sit there and work on a bad idea for months or weeks and then, you know, just kind of be spinning your wheels the whole time. But as long as you feel like something's working and it's happening, uh, you know, keep working on it, keep improving on it. And then if at the end of the day you want to take it to the tournament, go ahead. And yeah, Anthony uh, <laughs> stuck with the Durant, it looks like, and ended up getting top eight, which is crazy. I can't believe that it... Uh, it was uh, working well enough that uh, Anthony ended up going with it, but it's super cool to see uh, a mill deck, an actual mill deck. You know, Sanders deck, those are more control decks or stall decks. This is an actual mill deck. We haven't seen an actual mill deck like Durant do well since Durant. <laughs> I don't even know. What <laughs> Old was the last school Durant, time? yeah. I think it was Durant. So yeah, super sick. Um, and I'm actually really excited to try out their their build as well. Super aggressive build. PNEs, Battle VIP passes. It's looking for turn one, mill four, right? And then mill four for every turn from there on after. Uh, and the only real disruption card in the deck is the the Yellhorn, right? And I think that is probably the best one to kind of crushing hammers, a uh, little bit gimmicky. A lot of decks don't care about crushing hammer, but Yellhorn is something you can throw at your opponent's active Pokemon. Well, not every single turn, four for four turns and kind of force them to find an answer to that situation, right? They have to go find a switch card, retreat their Pokemon into a new attacker. So they have to set up a new attacker. And all this is causing them to burn cards pretty consistently. So, uh, yeah, I think that like, the, the the yell horns in there is like, definitely the best the best thing you could have, right, as a disruption card. He's got the cast form in here, too, just for the free retreat, which is pretty yep. funny. Throw that up there so that you can just yell horn and then free retreat into whatever you're wanting to be attacking with so yeah this is really cool shout outs to to anthony for being the first one to top eight uh with durant <laughs> i do have to say though, so we, we you did forget about probably the best mill deck of all time which is oh what am i forgetting? chinchino belloba bryson man oh, mewtwo no. gx well, we, cargo we forgot about that on purpose we forgot about that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> literally one of the few times cards have been banned from the standard format was because of that deck so yeah that deck was too that deck was broken it kind of had it had uh not quite it kind of had trump card card vibes though like that deck was worse i think that deck was actually worse to exist than something like even though everyone knows i'm not a huge fan of adp um i think that was worse though i I would i would i would say personally that the the cincino mill bell of a bryson man thing was definitely worse um, yeah, I remember that first online series tournament. I just pulled it up here <laughs> during COVID whenever there was the first limitless online series qualifier. It was just like everywhere. So many people were playing the Chinchino Mill deck. I've got it pulled up here. It's yeah. like of the top 32. It's like 20 of the the top 32 or something like that. <laughs> Such an absurd deck. Yeah, and there was like it was no there was nothing to learn. There was no matchups to learn. You could misplay every single turn with that deck and just be fine like it was just an absurd an absurd deck i hated that deck so much <laughs> <laughs> it was so because we had no gust effects back then too yeah, yeah, so you sat, no boss, sat yeah. behind your dolls and milled and just uh I custom catchers still i think was the, the thing in the format maybe but 
Yeah, so two controls in <laughs> two controls in top eight as well. Yeah. Let's get something else to say on Durant. And I think they're actually almost okay. So it looks like um Lewis Stevens uh is an exact sixty uh of what Sander played at LAIC. Uh, can't go wrong there though, of course. I'm not knocking them at all. And it looks like Aaron uh Stringfellow added the only thing I can see different here is they have a third crushing hammer. Uh, and two pal pad. I don't know what they cut though. Oh, down one Yvetal, it looks like, and I'm not sure what the other changes, but very, very close still to what uh no, there was only three Snorlax in Sanders build from oh, LAIC. Okay. Yeah, so a couple of changes from Sanders build, but basically the exact same deck, um, for sure. Um, and I guess actually speaking of those control decks, speaking of Sander, I think we may as well bring up what Sander actually played and got top eight at uh Stugart Regionals with, which was pretty wild. Yeah, this one is wild. So he he hung up one control deck in order to pick up another. We put away the Eldegoss loop with the double turbo energy, and we brought back out good old trusty Mewtwo V Union. Maybe Sanders' claim to fame, one of his ma many claim to fames, honestly, um, mm -hmm. in the Pokemon TCG. Of course, he got top four at NAIC earlier this year. Kind of shocked the world with the Mewtwo V Union. But this time it's got kind of some surprising partners. We've got the... 4-4 four, four Curlia line in here with the refinement ability. Might sound pretty familiar. Kind of like trade. You must discard a card <laughs> from your hand in order to use this ability. Once during your turn, you may draw two cards. Discard a card to draw two. Pretty solid. A great way to get those Mewtwo pieces into the discard pile. But the big surprise here to me is the combo of Gengar and Radiant Serena. So Gengar from Sword and Shield base set. It's a stage two. He's running a 2-0-1 Gengar line in here, meaning he's got two Ghastly, zero Haunter, so, and then one Rare Candy, and the one Gengar. And the Gengar has the Life Shaker ability. As often as you like during your turn, you may move one damage counter from one of your Psychic Pokemon to another of your Psychic Pokemon. So you can move damage off of Mewtwo, onto the Ralts and Curlias as often as you like. And then Radiant Serena has the Elegant Heal ability, which lets you, once during your turn, heal 20 damage from each of your Pokemon. So you can spread that damage out. Anything that's over the 200, then Mewtwo V Union can heal with its Super Regeneration attack. And then, yeah, just keep healing, keep the tanky plays up. What do you think of this version of the deck? This one was definitely wild to me as well. Yeah, so it's like a, it's not even like a, you attack with Mewtwo in this way. Yeah. Once your Mewtwo is set up, you move, you get hit, you move all the damage off it. Instead of using uh, the super regeneration from the Mewtwo V unit, you're using the final burn or the size explosion to do 300 damage or 16 damage counters anywhere you want. Uh, and then you move, you get hit, Gengar moves the damage out, Serena heals it all. And then you just you start hitting um, at this is just a, such a wild. <laughs> it's such a wild deck. And uh, it's super cool. It's definitely super, super cool. Uh, the, I mean, you beat, that's how you beat like Lugia and stuff like that. I'm sure you're beating Lost Box by just setting up Mewtwo V Union. That's usually just enough to beat Lost Box by itself. Um, and then your Mewtwo matchup, or your Mew matchup, I should say, um, you are winning with the Shady, Shadow Rider Calyrex V with the Shadow Miss once during your, or during your opponent's turn, they can't play any special energy cards or stadiums from their hand so you got the fan of waves in here you've got one flannery in here so you're basically trying to find those cards get their double turbo energy out of play and then fan of waves a plus shadow missing you shadow miss lock them for the rest of the game so that's how you're beating the mew matchup and then you have the double silene plus double pal pad uh to create a infinite loop at the end of the game so you never deck out it is a little bit less consistent than the yell cheer um so it's a little bit riskier because the Pal Pad could recover Yelchier plus Silene, then you flip two Silenes, and if you get four tails on those, you can uh, Yelchier back double Silene plus another supporter and go again. Um, so a little bit higher of a chance of just kind of decking yourself out uh, unintentionally with that. But um, a lot of games you're winning through damage, right? And that's so probably you don't why need to, he was okay yeah, with that. You right? don't need to infinite your deck as consistently. Um, so yeah, super sick, uh, idea. And I'm excited. This is another deck that I'm super excited to try out, to be honest. And I think Sander actually lost to the Vika vault that ended up taking down the whole tournament, but yeah, super sick, um, a super sick build. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just excited to try it out, uh, for sure. Um, cause it just, yeah, definitely just seems solid for sure.
Yeah, honestly, um, someone from Creat they need someone at Creatures, which is who makes the Pokemon trading cards. They just need to like go out to Sanders' home in the Netherlands and just study him, study his process, <laughs> figure out how it works, what goes through his mind, how do these pieces come together. I mean, just the card pool knowledge. To, like, did you know this Gengar existed? Did you know that this yeah. life shaker? Okay, okay. Well, I've, like, read it before, but I, I like, it was one of those cards, like, I read, and I was like, nah, that's not good, right? And yeah, then it's not something that's at the front of your mind ever, right? But, like, the, just the card pool knowledge in order to think of these combos and stuff like that. Um, yeah, super This sick. is, like, a an ultra-turbo Mewtwo V Union build. Like, you're trying to get Mewtwo V Union yeah. out, like, turn three, turn four, which I'm sure it's not too hard to pull off. Four level um, ball, four just... quick ball, four trekking yeah. shoes, three ultra ball, <laughs> like, and the four, four curly, of course. Yeah, the four, four curly. Fly through the deck. Yeah. And then I guess just to kind of wrap up uh, Brisbane Regionals, like we said, we talked about the interesting decks, the other three decks in top eight. Uh, Brent Tonneson, of course, one of the uh, most prominent names to come out of Australia, was in the top eight with a. Uh, a Lugia, Sean Murphy, also with a Lugia. Uh, we don't have Sean's list. Brent's list looks, I is it just Tord's list from LAIC? It, oh, not quite. Two collapsed, two vacuum. I take that back. He's got a V-Guard no energy in here as well. <clears throat> There's the V-Guard in there as well, but the four capture. Um, Three Archaeops so is definitely capping, though. Yeah, that's, I don't know what's happening. You got to play four Archaeops. <clears throat> even Bradner and them added the four Archaeops, so they even... Uh, and then a Mew in there and Mew in top eight as well. So those were pretty uninteresting additions. And I don't know, the Mew list could be really cool. The other Lugia list could be pretty cool. But we actually just can't see them because the lists are not, um, they, they're not public right now. They didn't release them. So who knows what those were in those builds. But to be honest, do we really care? It's just Mew. It's just Lugia. Uh, so let's move on to uh, the rest of top eight from Stugart then. We just talked about Sanders' crazy deck. Um, but the winning deck was also, I think, a pretty big surprise as well. Because this deck was kind of like a, I don't know, a mid deck to begin with, like leading up throughout, throughout like the last two formats. This has kind of been a deck. Vika Vault, Palkia, like Turbo Palkia with Vika Vault has been a deck, but it never saw too much success. And now all of a sudden it just wins Stuttgart Regionals. Also, Stuttgart Regionals, almost 800 players, 745 players, 182 at uh, Brisbane. What do you think about the Vika Vault chip? No, no Reggie Lucky VMAX. Yeah. So not Reggie Lucky um Vika Volt. it is just Vika Volt with the option of palkia also has of course the raikou v in here which i think you would just kind of expect yeah it feels a little toolboxy almost i think the the focus is obviously on the palkia but i think decks like this are super cool because you just have the options to to go many different routes depending on whatever scenario you find yourself in um, it's got that turbo engine right with the mew the radiant greninja the trekking shoes the Cross switchers, VIP passes, all those things. So this feels kind of like the Turbo Palkia deck that kind of dominated that first Australian regionals right after Astro Radiance came out. Mm -hmm. Died off a little bit. But yeah, very reminiscent of that with the four Mew. Mew is one of my favorite cards in the format that like is like a fringe card that doesn't see play that often, but um, is a lot of fun to utilize, right? It reminds me a lot of Jirachi. It's obviously not as powerful as Jirachi, but... Um, just being able to go between a bunch of Mews and try to get through your deck super fast is a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like the... <clears throat> uh, my, my big problem with Vika Vault in general is I actually don't think you have a great Lugia matchup, which would be like <laughs> one of the matchups where you look at it and be like, oh, it's a pretty good matchup, right? But I feel like almost everyone cut Dunsparce like around the globe going into this weekend in their Lugia decks, which it makes the matchup way better. Uh, overall and with the cross switchers you can definitely do some cheesy plays where you kind of chase archaeops i feel like early on uh in and games so you could go ahead also sometimes like if lugia goes first and doesn't get archaeops in the discard pile and then as this deck you just get a turn one vika vault which you can totally do with melanie uh, that's like yeah. kind of what this deck aims to do is to get a turn one vika vault attack um if you don't just have an Archeops in your hand that you can read the wind and discard, you're going to have a really hard time getting Archeops into play at all. And I actually watched this happen to Tord at Toronto. In round two, he played against a Reggie Alecki Vikavolt deck, and he lost in game three because in game two and in game three, he was unable to, like his just opening hand didn't have a way to put Archeops in the discard pile, and then his opponent got the 
item lockup and he wasn't able to find Archeops to read the wind it away. He wasn't able to find it to Serena it away or research it away at any point. And his opponent just kind of item locked him, item locked him and eventually won the game. So I imagine that probably has to have happened for Mateus at some point throughout the weekend against the Lugia. Yeah. And I feel like probably people were unexperienced. So in that match, you actually want to choose to go second as Lugia, Lugia in yeah. the matchup. So you have the draw supporter to work with to get the Archeops into the discard pile, which is the most important part of the deck, um, which is why you should also play for Archeops. <laughs> so you can get him in the discard pile more consistently against the Vika Vault matchup. Um, but yeah, that's what you actually want to choose to go second in this matchup. I think as both sides, you want to go second as Vika Vault and as Archeops, because the Vika Vault player, you want to give them that much less to work with to deal with your item lock. Um, and especially in like kind of an unknown meta situation, like if you go second as the Vika Vault player and you open a Mew, like what are they going to think, right? Like imagine how many, pl I imagine they won a ton of games because they just went second or in situations where the opponent won the coin flip and went first and they usually open the Mew and you're like, all right, go ahead. And the opponent's like, well, Mew, what does that mean? I saw a Mew list at LAI, or I saw a Lugia list at LAIC that played a Mew. Maybe they're playing Lugia. No one's really going to think about it being Vika Vault, right? And then next turn you're turn one Vika Vault and they just didn't burn a bunch of items they could have to set up further, right? So, um, yeah, definitely very interesting. Like that's like, uh, yeah, this this list just looks like a list from like two formats ago uh, when people were playing like the Palkia Vika Vault stuff. <laughs> like the Palkia feels also so weird in here, like when we have the Reggie Lucky VMAX, but it's just a great attacker to kind of have around, right? And it gives you a very powerful option uh, in itself as the Palkia. And then you also have the Radiant Credential with yeah. the Moonlight Shrukin in some situations as well. The Moonlight um, what? The Moonlight Shrukin from the Radiant Credential? Yeah, the Shrukin. Yeah. What'd I say? Shuriken? Yeah, Shuriken is right. <laughs> you said the Moonlight Shruken? What is a Shruken? <laughs> you know, all right, Shuriken. Uh, there's no... Uh, one thing that I found was a surprise moving away from that is there's no choice belt in the list. Um, so we're just not doing extra damage, I guess, which was curious to me for sure. Yeah, I mean, the choice belt Palkia lines up really belt. well. What's up? Go ahead. I said Palkia likes choice belt. I don't think Vikavald hates choice belt either. Yeah, I mean, it lets your Super Zap Cannon do 220, which is a pretty relevant number, right? So, yeah. like, that's a reasonable way to close out games. Raikou also likes Choice Belt in the same reason that Palkia likes Choice Belt. Yeah, Choice Belt's just a solid card. Um, maybe in testing, Mateus just found, like, mm -hmm. it was not necessary, right? Yeah. Even if, if it's... And that's, I think, a lot of times whenever you're needing to make space, those are the types of cards that get cut. The cards that are nice to have and like make sense in your deck, but are they necessary? And those are kind yeah. of the hard, the much. hard cuts to make, right? Where it's like it's just it's so good, but it's like I can win without it, and I do win most of the time without it being necessary. So even though it's good, I don't have to have it. Yeah, don't have to have it, and um, it does seem like Europe once again forgot to bring their Drapions because this 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 overall top eight was. Uh, dominated, not dominated, but there was three Mews in top eight, which was pretty scarce, I think, in the rest of the top cuts. There was just one in the um, Brisbane. One in Brisbane, three in uh, Stuttgart, zero in Toronto. So yeah, once again, Europe forgetting that Drapion is a card. That's fine. Forgive you once again for doing so. So did you play um, um, Drapion? No, but I have Kyogre. I don't need Drapion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kyogre's two Drapions in one, so <laughs> yeah. I'm chilling. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, the rest of the top eight, they like said Muse, second place, uh, Brent with the fusion Mew, which I feel like has fallen off, uh, especially at Toronto. I don't think I see, I saw a single fusion Mew, it was all uh, double turbo Mew. Um, <clears throat> so that's so it's definitely cool to see the fusion Mew there because I feel like that was like going into this format, that was the Mew everyone was talking about and hyping up, right. Definitely. I mean, we were definitely talking about it and we felt like it was going to be the way that most players went because that's what was happening in Japan. But yep. after LAIC, we saw a little bit from Fusion Mew, but it was still mostly double turbo Mew. And then even in um, Toronto, when we did the MetaShare breakdown on the stream day one, I mean, I guess that's something we can talk about too when we get to Toronto, but it was like day one was 34 and a half percent Lugia and then 12-something percent Mew, which is still a really high percent for one deck, 12-something percent. Um, but And it was double Turbo Mew specifically as well. Wait, in uh, Toronto? In Toronto, yes. Wait, how much How much Lugia was it? 34.5% day one. In day two or day one? Day one? Day one, 34.5, yes. 
Wait, it was that pop? It didn't seem that popular. I think it got weeded out pretty hard. They wanted it too. It was a it was a big yeah. Lugia hate tournament for sure. We'll talk about yeah. it a little more in depth at the. That um, was a Toronto section. That was my prediction though. My prediction was thirty to forty percent. So I'm glad I was. At least I was correct on that. I guess. So there's there's always that going for me, but. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's actually that is a lot though. That is a lot. So we got a couple of Mews here in the top four. One more in top eight, and then Magnus Peterson, former world champion in the seniors division, making top four here in the masters division with the Palkia. Yeah, Palkia, Palkia with the heavy Articuno emphasis. Two two only two two Palkia, and actually the list I think is. Uh, I was actually just comparing the list to Jake Gearhart's list, who got top eight in Toronto with Palkia. With a heavy Articuno emphasis, the two Articunos, the one jelly each. Um, and so on the oh, who's am I looking at right now? I've already got lost in the list. Oh, yeah. So uh <clears throat> the biggest difference, I guess, is the the one battle VIP pass versus four battle VIP pass. Uh, Peterson with the one battle VIP pass, Gearheart with four. Um, but besides that, the strategies are very similar. Both playing double Raihan, double Articuno, of course, the era does, both playing double quick shooting in Teleon as well. Yeah. Um no eskew in i didn't realize that yet jake with no eskew um ice cube. so ice cube so i gotta have a really tough time eskew because that's not a thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so no ice cube in jake's build uh peterson with the ice cube though so did have an answer to lost box where jake was kind of uh lacking that for sure yeah i mean they're gonna be pretty similar over all I think the VIP pass is probably the big point of discussion. I know that when you were playing Palkia, you were playing a version that only had the one VIP pass in it. Yeah. Um, and it when you, your strategy is going to be less focused on Palkia, like this deck is, you know, in the Lugia matchup, you don't really care about going for Palkia quickly. You don't really care about getting Palkia down at all until much later. It's all about getting Articuno set up super fast. So um, I think when that's the case, Articuno is a little bit more easy to get going then palkia you don't need to have a bunch of sobbles down turn one so even though it is nice i think you can get away with the one vip pass though yeah and you're like gonna keep calling like you're looking for keep calling turn one yeah. most games going second or even if you go first your turn two going second you can just keep calling um and yeah yeah you're not trying to get out you're not trying to rush out double palkia turn one right and be like i have to do this or they're gonna ko my lone palkia and i lose the game right so yeah, it's not like that anymore yeah i definitely think uh yeah, I think the one battle VIP pass. I, that's what I yeah, like you said. That, that's what I was rocking. Peterson seems to agree that, um, or Connor seems to agree that that is the way. I think I agree as well. I think Jake's, I think Jake's kind of trolling with four battle VIP pass. That looks like three dead cards in the list to me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I would say definitely. Uh, Magnus also did have VIP the uh, the rare candy, which is something that Jake didn't have. Just a way. I mean, with the three different Intellians, I guess, like as a way to yeah. set all of them up more efficiently, right? Yeah, and you gain that space when you don't play four battle VIP pass. But yeah, the uh, uh, definitely not necessary because you definitely have plenty of time in that matchup to like get to your second quick shooting. Um, but the candy does make things a little bit smoother and like more aggressive, just in case you need that uh, extra extra time or get out the extra quick shooting that much sooner or whatever. So, um, so yeah, really cool. I mean, it's a cool deck, right? It brings Palkia. Palkia is back, right? Uh, did need a little bit of help from the Articuno for the Lugia matchup, uh, and then Palkia is still like. Palkia, Inteleon, Radiant Greninja by itself that uh, uh, Magnus and Jake both played. Like, that's going to handle so many other matchups by itself, right? Like, you don't need um, you don't need that much. You don't need too much more to work with, right? To beat to beat Mew, to, hand, to be able to deal with Lost Box and whatever. Um, the Articuno was the key, though, to, to give you a shot against Lugia. Okay. Uh, and then um, anything else you want to mention here in this top eight from Stuttgart? Are we good to move on to Toronto? I think... I mean, the Lost Box that was here in the top eight, what, the just Sableye Charizard? It did have the Zara Aura in there, which a, is kind of yeah. an interesting tech, uh, as opposed to having something like Zek, uh, the Zekrom or the Raikou. Yeah, so this is an interesting take on, take on Lost Box. I don't think we've really seen anything like this. There's like, it's like a heavier take on the, it's like a heavier Mirage Gate build, but no Greninja, which uh, Greninja is a big deal to have alongside the Mirage Gate build, I feel like, in general, but you do lose the power and efficiency of Charizard. But um, I don't know. This is definitely interesting. I've never seen a build quite like this. No twin energy either to combo with earlier Snorlax, earlier Zard plays to help deal with the um, to help deal with the Stoutland. So you're really all in on that lone Snorlax for the most part. I feel like to help to deal with Stout. I guess you could still Mirage Gate to a Charizard. Like it's still possible against the Stoutland. So 
uh, which is like the big the big problem with this deck though, or loss on box in general is like got to KO Stoutland when it makes its way into play. Um, so yeah, interesting take on Lost Box, but uh, another Lost Box. There's so many ways to play it. I don't know. I, don't, I almost feel like there's not a wrong way to play Lost Box. So nothing too crazy there, I guess. Overall, just I haven't seen a build quite like that yet until now. Um, and yeah, there's something else really cool here, right? The, a couple of Mews or a lot of Mews, a one Lugia, one Lost Box Sanders deck. But we already talked about that. Two of the Mews were Fusion. I guess that's worth mentioning. Two of them played Fusion. Two of them, or the other one was just the, the double turbo build. So, uh, but nothing too crazy. Well, we can move on to Toronto then, and I was able to go back to the stream and find the segment that has the meta shares um, from day one and day two. So yeah, we had the graphs for this just like we did uh, for, I guess, Peoria Regionals. And yeah, Lugia Archaeops in day one, 34.5%, 366 players using that deck. 15.2% on the Mew VMAX, a little higher than I said. I think the 12% is maybe for the day two meta. Um, two different Lost Box variants at the third and fourth most popular. Really close, though. 5.8% on the Sableye Radiant Charizard and 5.7% on other Lost Zone Toolbox. So that'll include things like Azul's deck with the Kyogre and the Zekrom. I mean, and then that would that. also include things like the... Yeah, uh, like amazing rare Rayquaza and stuff like that. Yeah. So anything that without two? Charizard, pretty much. Is that the day two uh, percentages? That was that. This is day one, and okay, then okay, yeah. the fourth most played at four point four percent. You got to guess Azul. Uh, the fourth most played. Or fifth, fifth most played. Fifth most played. Sorry. Okay. So okay. So so Lugia, so is Lugia Mew, Mew the lost two box, lost box. box. Yes. Yes. Wait. So the Lugia was thirty four percent. Mew was what? Twelve. Fifteen. 15, okay. And then it was Lost Box at 5, Lost Box at 5, basically? Mm-hmm. 5.8, 5.7. 5.8, 5.7. Um, my prediction was a little bit off. Of one. Yeah, I'm like, my prediction was Mew would be 10 to 15, Lost Box would be 10 to 15. So I'm pretty spot on there. And then fifth most played deck. I don't even remember if I came up with a prediction of this because the meta drops off drastically after those three decks. That's like <laughs> popularity. Um, this isn't that drastic. It went from what is the... 60 people on the other Lost Zone toolbox <laughs> into 47 players on Reggie Gigas. Okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense, Reggie. Yeah. By the way, don't play Reggie. It's not a good deck right now. <laughs> <laughs> there was a couple players who were battling it out in day two, but yeah, what, it wasn't quite good enough to make it into top cut. And then the sixth most played, 39 players on it, being Arceus Duraladon. Okay, so Arcus Throughout on up there a little bit, which makes sense. And it did get second place, of course, at Toronto as well. Um, yeah, it is kind of the uh it's kind of the deck it feels like right now, where it's like I right, I'm gonna play this and if the if the Lugia players aren't playing vacuum, I got them. If they're playing vacuum or two vacuum, all right, I don't got them, I'll pack it up. Um but I think we did see a, a decent amount of cuts of the vacuum. Um that is probably what helped Christian get to that that second place finish a decent uh probably pretty well also like a, a decent amount of lost box as well which is also a good matchup for the uh for the Arceus to round it on and when uh, we yeah, look at the too, uh, wild then with the the meta share at all that's like basically what I predicted to be honest and then was, we, uh, when we look that. at what it was when it hopped over to day two we're looking at thirty eight percent on the Lugia V Star Archaeops so a little bit of an increase not okay. the drastic fifty percent that we saw at LAIC but. Mm -hmm. 38% in the day two. Mew went down a little bit, down to 11.7%, 14 players in day two with it. And then these two decks went up, the two different Lost Box variants, 9.2% a piece, 11 decks a piece, 11 on the Sableye Radiant Charizard, and then 11 on other Lost Zone Toolbox. Five players on the Reggie Gigas at 4.2%, four players on the Arceus Duraludon with the 3.3%, and then 24.2% would be other decks to fill it out. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm not surprised Lost Box went uh, went up in popularity. And yeah, Lugia uh, Lugi did not see. Lugia went from 25% to 50% at LAIC, and at this one it was, what, 34 to 38? So... And not as big of a, a jump up for sure. That was like <clears throat> a conversion, without a doubt. Yeah, but still, but still, yeah, by far the most popular deck. And like B and Chip said, we definitely both think it is the still the best deck in the format. Um, and I actually think the best deck to come out of all three tournaments 
Uh, and I hate to give him too much credit, but it's got to be Bradner's Lugia build with the 1-1 one, one Espeon VMAX, I think was like after I heard that they were playing that. And I, actually, it's funny. I had heard someone mention the Espeon VMAX either before LAIC or at LAIC. Um, I think it was before. So I'd heard about it before, never gave it too much thought. Um, but then Bradner and crew rolled up with it at Toronto. And I think it was just the best deck out of all three tournaments. Like I think it was because like theoretically, um, if you put that deck in any of the tournament top eights, it's probably winning a majority of them, right? Um, so Lugia's problem is paralysis and energy disruption. We've seen that from the control decks that um, with the Evitals, and we've seen that with the paralysis decks, with the Zekroms, and the Articuno. Well, Espeon VMAX has an ability called Solar Revelation that says prevent all effects of attack from your opponent's Pokemon down to all of your Pokemon that have any energy attached to them, which includes the effect of the attack from Evitol and the paralysis from Articuno and uh zekrom so if you set up your espion and you set up your lugia or whatever attack you're attacking with alongside your archaeops you just kind of get going all these counters to lugia don't do anything so it's like one of the biggest counters that lugia can kind of play right now to counter almost every counter that counters lugia right it effectively makes all of your energy a wash energy for yeah. its <laughs> respective type right so yeah espion is very powerful um, yeah, and I, I don't disagree as well with what your sentiment of it being the best deck on the weekend from all of the tournaments. I mean, we saw Rahul lost the winning in, so he was almost in top eight with the same 60 as Isaiah. John Ng was playing in day two. I think Regan was also on the deck. I don't remember exactly how he finished, but um, yeah, they had the crew on the deck. And I mean, it's got all the big regular Lugia pieces in here, the Evil Tall, the Stoutland, the Charizard. Just found a way to fit the Espeon in. They did also get the Guru in here, so maybe took a little bit of a note out of Tord's book for yeah. that one. Guru definitely solid. And then went to the four Lugia V uh, and the four Archeops, which are changes from their LAIC list, but did what cut down to the two V Star. Did go down to the two V Star, which is what we saw from Lucas Calza in the finals of LAIC. Yeah, yeah. So a couple changes up from there from the LAIC builds. And uh, yeah, the SP is also like a powerful attacker in the mirror match as well. Um, and I think like the, I, I think maybe the mirror match suffers a little bit from the addition of SPM, but you're cutting stuff like Dunsparce. You have no you have no vacuum or stadium. So those cards weren't really super relevant in the mirror match. Of course, collapse is always nice to remove liabilities from your bench. But when you gain an attacker like Espeon that, uh, yeah, when someone sets up four energy on a Lugia or something, uh, and you, like it makes it hard for them to like be able to put extra energy in play. The Espeon's hitting pretty hard. Espeon can't be one hit KO'd by Charizard, and it stops Yvetal from getting big one hit KOs on your big Lugia or your big Espeon, right? So there's a lot of utility in the mirror match to be gained from the Espeon. Um, but I don't know if it's like just better than playing, you know, just like a more consistent, straightforward build as far as just mirror match goes, but it probably is pretty close. It's either probably still 50 50 um, or maybe just slightly disadvantaged. I don't know. It's not something I've like tested a whole ton with. I know uh, Bradner would tell you that the list is probably favored, um, but Bradner did lose to um, Farah in the mirror match. Farah actually also got top eight at LAIC, so back to back top eights for for them uh definitely switch up their lugia build as well they were playing the trekking shoes <laughs> mew like turbo consistent yeah. quote-unquote turbo consistent build because you could also argue toward maybe had the most consistent build of lugia at laic but they were different takes on how to be consistent uh but no trekking shoes no mew so obviously they don't think those things were great or maybe the tech cards were better worth the space because we see heavy collapse stadium two collapse in this one i guess you could consider that happy right and i guess the biggest attacker that i saw that they are playing um and they also played the bird keeper to deal with paralysis um that i saw a decent amount of people playing is the snorlax with the uh the snorlax with the unfazed fat ability and the the thumping snore um which is like an interesting addition especially with only one bird keeper in the deck i feel like i would be a little bit scared of the very risky stuck. <laughs> yeah i think yeah. i'd be scared of getting stuck very very risky yeah and i think it's an okay option right it can hit for more damage than um something like an amazing rare raikou right um so you can take a two prize ko on something like a luminion or a crobat in a mirror match yeah. situation that is going to be this is less investment for you to get to that knockout on something like the crobat than your evil tall right which you want to save for a lugia that's really built up yeah. it's got more hp and also you don't really want to throw your charizard at one of those pokemon and it's going to be more energy efficient than either of those two options so i think it's definitely solid 
You got to definitely be mindful of when you use it with only one bird keeper, but does, of course, have the Lumineon to fetch the bird keeper out at the right time. And also, sometimes you just flip two heads and you're like, we're chilling. Yeah. Also, if you like, it's um, also if like, if your opponent is like not knocking out your Snorlax, maybe you don't care if you're not attacking on the next turn anyways, because maybe they didn't get a prize card. Yeah. But if you like go up against like a Lost Box deck or something like that, and they just like can like snipe around your Snorlax, or you go up against something that has Greninja, then they can be like, hmm, well, the Snorlax is currently asleep. The chances of it staying asleep are more likely than it waking up. I'm just going to go ahead and not KO this thing and set up some bigger play for the future. And then if you can't access your bird keeper because your bench is full or your minion's gone or used or whatever, um, yeah, you could get stuck. So got to be careful with it. But yeah, it does have the out of at least uh, the bird keeper in there. So hopefully Sonic isn't staying asleep for too long. Um, but yeah, nothing too crazy in this build. Just kind of the Snorlax is the main thing to point out there. And also did choose to rock the bird keeper to have an out to the uh, paralysis. And then the rest of the uh, top eight, I guess we start from top down, right? Piper winning with the Mewtwo V Union control deck. Um, which uh, I don't think was too big of a surprise for me personally. Um, and then also did not, was able to weather the storm of the, uh, what do you even want to call it? The top eight time rule or whatever, yeah, where, yeah. yeah. Single so elimination as, time rules. Yeah, single elimination time rules. So what do you think about the Mewtwo V and taking it all down in the end here in Toronto? Yeah, it's very rare that we see control decks win these major tournaments. We were talking before the cast, and I think it's only happened... One other time when a player won Assault Lake City Regionals with Sableye Garboder. Um, but yeah, I mean, the top cut rules. I mean, we've seen it happen to Sander multiple times. Um, I don't think it yep. was necessarily <laughs> the case in um, Stuttgart this weekend. But at LAIC and at NAIC, he lost because he lost a game in a best of three. And if that happens to you as a control player in top eight, because of when time is called in game three, the way the rules work, whoever is going to be ahead on prizes after turns is going to win that game and move on to the next part of single elimination. And that's just really difficult for the troll control deck to manage. But it's not a problem if you just win both of your games. If you just 2-0 everyone, then it's just fine, which is what Piper was able to do. Yep, just 2-0 everyone. And uh, go to victory uh, in the end. Uh, interesting. A couple interesting cards in the list um, for sure. Uh, stuck with the Crushing Hammers, which is well, something that I wasn't sure uh, if was worth it in Mewtwo V Union going into Toronto. I worked on a list. Um, I didn't have Crushing Hammers in there myself. Played a little bit more aggressively with Trekking Shoes to try and get out the Mewtwo V Union. So stuck with the Crushing Hammers. Uh, and then a big card that <laughs> a card that was actually like, uh, I don't know if it mattered too much. It was pretty entertaining in uh, Piper's top four match up against Caleb was the Misfortune Sisters, which looks at the top five cards of your opponent's decks, uh, opponent's deck, and then discard any number of item cards you find there. Um, so kind of like a mill card. I think this is specific, specifically very powerful in the Mew matchup. Yeah. Um, because Mew, if they are able to hold all of their power tablets, always threatens a one-hit KO on the Mewtwo V Union. And actually a card that is absent from this list that I'm actually surprised by is there's no Tool Jammer or Big Charm which means when you go up against Mew, uh, they don't even need, like, they don't need as much as you they normally would. If they got a Choice Belt, if they got a Double Turret, if they got a Mew that can attack with Techno Blast, plus Choice Belt, plus Quad Tablet, they're one at KO in the Mewtwo V Union, right? And a lot of people play Silene, so that could even be an extend, that could extend you to a fifth or even sixth Power Tablet, right? Um, so the Jammer makes them have to work a little bit harder, um, but I, I feel like that between the Energy Disruption and the Misfortune sis Sisters and the Sydney, which is another... Very good disruption card in the Mew matchup. That's probably enough to pull out the dubs against uh, against Mew for sure. But yeah, that's like the only real, the only real addition I think we're talking about. But besides that, it is just kind of Mew two V Union, um, control stall, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think that um, on the point of not having big charm or jammer just the fact i mean because the main matchup it's good in is the mew matchup right that's the main reason you yep. want one of those two cards and the fact that mew is playing like three lost vacuum right now makes it way less True. relevant i feel like to even have it because it's like you're not going to be able to disrupt those vacuums though i mean piper does have the one marnie um sydney can only discard tools and special energy so you can get rid of a choice belt i guess but other than that I don't think that uh, it's probably worth playing because, like, just the fact they can hold on to those lost vacuums and go with it. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I also fair. think the Misfortune Sisters is great to get rid in the, that matchup of Switch cards because 
boss stall is also a very real win condition in that matchup. If uh, many lists only have like one rope, one switch, and then cross switchers. So if you have no Pokemon on your bench, they can't play cross switcher. So you can definitely get yourself to a point where you put Galar Mine in play, get rid of all their stadiums with the Sydney, and then Misfortune Sisters away the switching cards. And yeah, there's plenty of ways that it can be useful. And sometimes it can just let you accelerate a game a little quicker, which can be useful in a 50 minute match. Um, yep. You know, w single game sets are definitely a thing that'll happen. But yeah, uh, I mean, Azul, you played this deck at Peoria Regionals, right? So Baltimore or Baltimore, yeah, you played the Mewtwo V Union, so um, you've got some experience with it. And it sounds like you were considering it for this tournament as well. What made you not want to pull the trigger? Um, and I mean, obviously, it ended up being a good call for Piper. Finn Lynch was also in day two with the deck. There was another player, Giancarlo, I think was his name, that was in um, day two, made top 32 with the Mewtwo V Union. So they were they were doing pretty decently. Yeah, I think I just think if you play against a, a, a Mew player who understands the matchup uh, and is smart about it and play Silene or even worse, Silene and Palpad, it, it feels like it's just like an auto loss. <laughs> like, I think the list that uh, I played at Baltimore um was uh, a build that was definitely favored against Mew, but it had you know roxanne uh two marnie i believe and three or four well, we had three pats of the peak so like there was like alternate we were like extremely trying to counter the Mew matchup um, but i feel like lists like this you're definitely relying a little bit on uh the inexperience of the Mew players i think you go up against um because i think if you do play up against a a good Mew player um, or a player who knows the matchup well then you're going to run into kind of a, a tough situation but generally um you know the best players in the game who are going to show up who are going to be those more experienced players choose not to play mew so that is something you can always kind of uh calculate into your deck decision choice is just being like well if the players who are going to bring this deck aren't going to be as good as the players who bring this other deck that i beat then you know the matchup goes from an unfavorable matchup to like a 50 50 or even slightly advantaged right so like taking that ta i think taking that uh, making that judgment call is never a bad thing to do but that's kind of the thing that kind of turned me personally off the uh off the deck but yeah, so Piper wins her second regionals of the year. So insane mm -hmm. accomplishment. There's very few people who've ever won multiple regionals in the same season. Uh, so big congrats to Piper. It's a short list, and they're all really great players. So now she finds herself on that list as well. Let's move through the rest of this top eight, starting with the second place, Christian Labella with the Arceus Duraludon, Azul's favorite deck. <laughs> Making top eight, Azul. What do you have to say for yourself? You were so wrong. Arceus Duraludon was obviously the play. I mean, I don't know if that makes me wrong. Even when Arceus Duraludon won Milwaukee, I said like if you re if you replay that tournament ten times, I think Arceus Duraludon's maybe winning. You're once. just such like, a hater, bro. You're <laughs> such a hater. It's insane. I still don't think the deck's very good. I still don't think the deck's very good. Your Lugia matchup, if they rock us, uh, just a vacuum. If they have a vacuum, I think is unfavorable um i mean besides that you're doing okay you do struggle up against uh any of the control builds like we saw piper taking down christian in the finals obviously so you struggle against any of the control decks like yeah i'm just still not a huge fan i think it's second but i don't know i feel like arcus duraldon has to work so much harder than every other deck and get so lucky and i think the big one of the bigger things is like the matchup it's not very it's not good good against a ton of the fringe decks uh and it's got a bad mew matchup as well so Still not a fan. They get second. Con congrats to Christian for getting second, of course. But uh, yeah, I would not be rocking it personally in the near future uh, at all. But, uh, you know, to each their own. To each their own. Yeah, <laughs> there, I mean, and it was one of the more popular decks in the tournament as well. So there were plenty of people who were rocking the Arceus to Raladon. Um, yeah, it's not one of my favorites either. But I think, you know, it can take advantage of players who are not as experienced as how to play around like the specific strategies of it. And also, I mean, Isaiah, for example, they didn't play lost vacuum for this tournament, yep. right? Their whole crew. So, I mean, they don't have an answer. If you just go Starbirth for two parasol, put them on the two Duraludons, right? Like, yeah, if you get one Duraludon V max set up with a parasol, it is just kind of, just kind of over. Um, so I see only other thing to mention here is we talked about Charlie. We talked about Jake uh talked about both lugia decks so then there was caleb and grant um two of my testing partners we were all playing the amazing rare kyogre deck i already kind of talked about some of the changes we've made um but uh yeah once again getting back into top eight i think that's grant's third top eight in a row now uh so that's pretty sick 
And uh, yeah, the Kyogre doing it once again. We had some unfortunate, like I like I looking back on it, maybe it wasn't too unfortunate. In the last round, I played against Caleb, <laughs> and then Danny played against Grant. So there's four of us playing the exact same sixty, playing against each other on the winning end. Um, it did get two of us into top eight, which is sick. And the rest of our matchups that we could have played up against weren't great, to be honest. We could have hit Piper or Christian, so this might have been our best route to get two of us into top eight. But yeah, the Kyogre back in the top eight. Um, which should be to no one's surprise because uh, I don't know, Lost Box is just really, really good in general. I don't even know if like Kyogre is actually the best way to play it, to be honest. There's so many different ways you can build it and play it, but uh, it's definitely maybe the most fun way to do it. Um, and I used Aqua Storm way more at this tournament than I did at LAIC. I feel like Aqua Storm was like, we still haven't a, seen uh... it on the stream, though. That's like <laughs> the people need to see it happen. As well. <laughs> I watched one of your games where you aqua stormed and yeah, it's definitely cool to watch the the wheels turning because you're having to think through like there's the a lot odds of and you know which energy types you're putting back into the deck because you're planning multiple turns ahead with like I'm gonna I think the one game I'm thinking of you had to Mirage Gate to Greninja to do damage and then the next turn Mirage Gate to Kyogre plus play escape rope or something like that. Some yeah. crazy combo or something <laughs> like that, uh, that you were having to plan through. Um, so yeah, it's always fun from my perspective at these tournaments, just watching the wheels turn in those kind of unique spots. But yeah, uh, the Kyogre is definitely a lot of fun. Are, are you hanging it up for Arlington though? Like moving forward, this feels a little perilous where the meta kind of ended up here. Control, not a great matchup. Arceus Duraludon, not a great matchup. And Espeon VMAX in the Lugia deck, not very good for, for the Lost Box either. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it feels like, I feel like Lost Box can probably solve some of the problems, but probably the Kyogre build specifically, um, it's probably not worth going that all in on something like the uh, the finisher like Kyogre. So I feel like Lost Box will be fine, but maybe like the Kyogre build is probably Zard not... Build. Yeah, Lost Box in general will be fine. And there's time to figure out like the best way to play it from here. But yeah, I feel like maybe maybe it's time for Kyogre to to chill for a little while. It was definitely fun while it uh while it lasted though for sure. Definitely. So great showing from the squad. So congrats Azul once again on the top 16. And congrats to all the finishers, all of the people who made top eight at tournaments this weekend. Some interesting stats though. There were, you know, four top eights at three tournaments, meaning 12 players over the weekend made top four at these events, right? So mm -hmm. in the top four of those 12, there was only one Lugia in top four of all of the tournaments, and it was Kieran in Toronto, which is so wild to think that that, like, no one, no one would have predicted that going <laughs> into this weekend. Um. Yeah. I don't One out of twelve. It. No. But I'm shot. not that surprised. Once you look at like you know what was played, it's like okay, it kind of makes sense. Right? It's sure. not too big of a shock. You know, pretty anti Lugia meta overall developing in all three of the regions that had tournaments. So yeah, it's not that it's not that surprising. But yeah, I would have expected maybe a Lugia to squeak out a, a dub or something here or there. Uh, and I think if like Bradner had gotten a different bracket, Bradner definitely would have won Toronto. I feel like. Oh, he also got um, donked in game one against Kieran. Yeah. So like, yeah. I mean, it just wasn't, he didn't have a great set, unfortunately. So yeah, the two Lugias hitting each other on top. I guess actually maybe that's not true. Cause if Bradner had got a different bracket uh, and took it out Piper, then Christian probably actually would have won the tournament instead. So I guess the winner of this tournament actually kind of looking at it for Toronto was either going to be Christian or Piper, right? Like that was kind of one of them was winning this tournament. And it was if the, the way Piper wins uh, is if they hit Christian uh, in the final. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of, that's the way it kind of uh, worked out this time around for sure, actually. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, but I, th I don't think Lugia's going anywhere. Like, me and you both think Lugia, we think the best turn. I think the best deck out at the tournament, out of these tournaments, like, if you put all these top eights together, the best deck is Bradner's deck um, overall. And then, yeah, I think more more people will adopt the Espeon VMAX. And at that point, got to come up with some new answers for lugia because all of a sudden espion vmax kind of already just beats everything that you <laughs> that all the answers will just get beaten with a 1-1 tech right which is actually cool to see because i feel like we haven't had that in a while where you add in a 1-1 tech to your deck and it, it like actually solves problems consistently yeah it, it's been a minute um i think we saw it like maybe a little bit with some of the like arceus toolbox decks early last season Mm -hmm. But it was more in like an attacker sense, less so in like a support sense, which is kind of what the Espeon feels, though it can attack. It's like an okay attacker. 
It's mostly yeah. for its ability, obviously. So, yeah, definitely cool. And, uh, yeah, congrats to all the top eight finishers on the weekend. Even, uh, you know, big or small, it doesn't matter where the tournament is in the world and how many players are at the event. Getting top eight at any of these regional championships in this day and age is a difficult and an accomplishment you should be proud of. Definitely, for sure. All right, that's going to do it for the results of the weekend. Moving on, we've got Guess That Flavor Text, which is a segment in the show where me or Chip, it'll be my pick this week, pick a flavor text on a card to read to the other host, and then that host tries to guess the card. So the, the first hint they get is the flavor text, and if they guess the card based on just the flavor text, or guess the Pokemon, not like the actual card specifically, but just the Pokemon, based on the flavor text, they get four points, uh, and then we have three lifelines. For each lifeline you lose, you get one less point if you get the card correctly after that, or get the Pokemon correctly after that, and the three lifelines are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and read an attack name. Chip, are you ready for your flavor text this week? Yep, ready to increase my lead without a doubt. Oh, that is true. You are ahead by one. All right. <laughs> It collects honey every day. It rubs honey onto the hairs on its legs to carry it back to its nest. Okay. I am definitely immediately thinking of... Um, I'm thinking of a Gen 2 Pokemon because I remember in gold and silver that that was i think the first it was it gold and silver or was it in like the diamond and pearl era where you could rub honey on a tree in the video game to like have an encounter appear i think it was that a thing? yeah it is definitely a thing azul has never played a video game by the way oh. what it's worth a pokemon video game um, video game. <laughs> um i want to say that it's like centret or fur it let me get the flavor text one more time from you it collects honey every day. It rubs honey onto the hairs on its leg to carry it back to its nest. On its leg? Mm-hmm. The on hairs its, on, on its, its leg. leg. Legs. What, what? Is there a one-legged Pokemon No, legs, out legs, legs, legs. Okay, okay, okay. You legs. said leg at first. <laughs> no, I said legs. Play it back. It definitely said leg. Anyway. <laughs> um, some all right, I'm going to use some lifelines here, I think, for sure. My inclination is towards like centret or fur it centret doesn't really have much to speak of in the leg department though little stubby <laughs> stubby feet not much going on That's as far honey. as legs are concerned so not, not gonna be bringing much honey back to the nest the honey yeah yeah no, the <laughs> nest isn't getting that much honey from a centret but fur it is a long boy fur it is a long boy okay um Can't i'm gonna the fan with those little stubby <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with what set the card is from. The card is from Fusion Strike. Okay. Um, Even thought. I don't think there is a Centret or Furret in Fusion Strike. <clears throat> I don't think there is. All right. Um, so I'm maybe a little bit more lost. There's like the smear goal. All right, what set is the or sorry, what stage is the card? Is stage two. Okay. What what set did the card honey come out of? Now that I'm thinking about that. What set was that? Uh brilliant stars. Maybe if you bad Strike. card. Uh, <laughs> yeah, bad card. And then let's go ahead and just <laughs> complete the trifecta. Let's read an attack name. Get me a little more help. Gust. Gust? I mean, so now it sounds... I mean, that's got to be a flying-type Pokemon, or so a colorless Pokemon. Most likely, as a stage two, it rubs honey on its legs? Man, I am not sure. This is a tough one, Azul. Um, I thought this one was a little bit middle of the road, to be honest. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just stupid, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, bro. Gust? The gust is really throwing me for a loop. I'm trying to think through. Um, 
I mean, I guess... I guess it could be Talonflame. Is it Talonflame, maybe? I think the Talonflame is in Evolving Skies that I'm thinking of. I don't think it's Infusion Strike. Man, I really don't know. Uh, I gotta make a guess here pretty soon. So I'm gonna go with just some other Stage 2 bird that knows Gus, because I don't think it's Talonflame. I'm gonna guess... Um, Star After. It is not Staraptor, the Pokemon that is lathering up its legs in honey to bring back to the nest is Butterfree. Butterfree is the Pokemon that uh, <laughs> to bring, Bro, bring the honey back to the, the please nest. Look at the this card. On its legs. Look at this card, Azul. Look at this card and tell the me card. where Butterfree's legs are. Where are Butterfree's legs? Well, I guess the butterfly doesn't. Really, is it just feet? Because they also float. Like butterfly's like feet just float away from its body. There are no legs on butterfly, unless those things are the legs. Have you ever like watched the the a butterfly in the in the anime? It's just like the, the they're like separated from the no, it's like, the not body, right? separated. What are uh, you talking but, about? It's not separated. <clears throat> oh no, you are right. They are connected a little bit. Never mind. It's got the tiny little legs. What is that flavor text? But they're it almost just like just just feet. It's almost like no legs. The hairs on its legs. This this creature is lucky to have too. one hair on its tiny little leg. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening, man? What the heck? No, I do think it is a little bit uh, out of place. I want to talk sure. to Mr. Pokemon about this one because it, the anatomy here is not making much sense to me. But well, you you <laughs> you guessed. You were thinking about bird. Po Birds don't have hair. They have feathers. So you, if you had gotten that connection, maybe you would have yeah, guessed. I don't. Yeah. I don't know if you would have got the butterfly though. I mean, yeah, I guess it's like a bug. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. The feet are connected to the, but they. They look like just feet. They don't even look like legs. It we looks like just some on. big old feet. We're not gonna talk. We're not. This is not a feet <laughs> podcast. We're. <laughs> All right. We're not moving doing the on. Markiplier for Pokemon here. <laughs> the last topic we we're gonna briefly talk about to close out the podcast is. The World Championship Point Bar. How many championship points do you need to qualify for Worlds? Is it too high? Is it too low? And I think the big thing that kind of brings this discussion up is Piper just won their second regional championship this year, and they are not qualified <laughs> for the World Championships. After winning 2,000-person tournaments, they could not compete in the World Championships if it was tomorrow. And that seems a little bit ridiculous. And I think most people would agree. A lot of people probably don't think about it too much, but it's like, and I'm sure Piper is maybe even going to win another regionals this year, but we'll definitely be able to get a hundred more points. Yeah. So they're going to get their world's invite. But the question is, should they already have their world's invite after winning 2000 person tournaments? Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this, something similar to this topic, a handful of times in the last few months. And it really just all comes back to this system that is in place is old and it needs to be revisited because this was put in place in 2016 when tournaments were averaging like three to 400 people at them. They added $5,000 to the person who got first and then all of a sudden regional started getting 600 people at them, then 700 people. And then now we're at the point where we're looking at thousand plus person tournaments Arlington is looking like it's going to be 11, maybe 1,200 masters. It is. I think it is, yeah. Um, the numbers for uh, Toronto were like 1,400, I think, but that was including juniors and seniors, and then obviously there's like 100 no-shows or something like that. Yeah. It happens every single tournament. Um, but yeah, it is a... Uh, it's it's wild that Piper has won two tournaments with over a thousand players at them. I think obviously to everyone, I, I mean, no one can have seen this and think that Piper does not deserve to be at the world championships, but it is theoretically possible though. This is very unlikely that it would ever happen, but Piper could play every tournament for the rest of the year, have the worst string of luck and then miss her world's invite. It is possible. Right. And the fact that, Someone can win these two tournaments and not have their invite and not be able to be featured at Worlds is just wild. And the the structure needs to be revisited. I think that it's totally reasonable that – I mean, I don't know. I, I, I know like for Pokemon Go, they don't even have championship points. They just give people who um, – I think you have to get like top – 
three at one of their tournaments, th- third place or higher. Recent. Huh? It's because they go to a bracket cut eventually, right? Yeah, How yeah. So work? there there would be a first, second. There's a clear first, second, third. It's not like top four or anything like that. Because no, they don't they don't have a bracket? No, it's a double Elim bracket. But because it's double oh, Elim, you have it's a clear okay, okay, first, it's a double second, bracket. Okay, yeah. that's fine then. Okay. I was gonna say if it's just like kind of like what we do, Swiss into bracket, that'd be weird to have. Yeah. So I think it's it might be top two, but I think it's top three at regionals yeah. get a trip to worlds, right? Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. So I don't know. I I think that I like the idea of a championship point system and the ability for people to earn points at their locals and then also at regionals. But I think that there's got to be some other option here, like maybe another kicker in place where if there's over 800 people or over 500 people at a tournament that first place at the regionals now instead of 200 points now gets 300 points or 400 points or even just yeah. their world's invite honestly if if someone i think if someone wins a thousand person pokemon tournament throughout the year they deserve to be at the world championships just automatically yeah so i think they should definitely just like i think that's what it should be there should be the point system for being able to get your uh invite as well as playing for stipends and travel awards and all that stuff as well uh, but then there should also just be uh invites awarded like that's what you if you get top four worlds you have a world's invite but you don't get 500 championship points right so that does exist already in the game right there are invites awarded with zero championship points right like uh andre who won worlds could not play a tournament the whole year and then show up at worlds next year right which i think is also fair like i think they should be able to do that right and that goes to the top four players in each division at worlds right um but i don't see why that can't be also added to some of these like uh, regional tournaments if the regional tournament maybe a thousand players is the cutoff or maybe it's maybe they give to 800 players because that's when you get the extra round in day two so they're saying okay when we get to 800 players in uh when we get to 800 players not only do we get the extra round in day two but if you win the tournament you also get your world's invite and then for ic's you'd probably do like the top two get their world's invite well if you win an ic you get 500 points right so I guess you do get your world's invite from that, but maybe you do it where it's like, if you get top eight at an IC, you get your, you get your points and then you also get your world's invite and the points can be used, will be applied towards, like I said, you know, trying to get the day two uh, invite or travel awards or whatever it might be. Right. Sure. So you get all that, uh, get all that as well through the points. But yeah, it does seem like when you're winning, winning are placing very high in some of these huge international championships or regionals, there should be, I don't know. It just feels like you should just be able to get your invite from that. Just like winning a thousand. I would be fine with that. Like, I think that's reasonable for, cause like Pokemon is already like on the basis of like playing in the world championships, the biggest, it's already like pretty casual in terms of that. Like when you compare it to something like magic where like their world championships, is like 16 players or something. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, so I'm fine for it to be like, not taking a step further, but make it like a little bit more relaxed. And also it means with the later tournaments in the years, or if you only have the chance to go to like one, maybe two regional championships, there's always the potential to just get your world's invite. Right? Yeah, I think that that is a huge part of it. And that's some of the part of why I think it's a good time for us to talk about this is I've seen a lot of discourse on Twitter from competitive players that already just barely a quarter of the way through the season are feeling burnt out because this goal feels so unobtainable, especially for North American players. Like we do have the most regionals. I get it, but 500 points is so many points and you only get to take your best six regional finishes. You can't just go to all 10 plus regionals, 15 regionals and, you know, get top 256 at all of them. And then, you know, try to get your invite based off of that. Um, You have to like have had good placements uh what with six finishes you have to have averaged around like 90 80 to 90 points per regional uh that you get to keep as a finish which is at least a top 16 finish which yeah i mean there's few people that are going to be able to go to 10 regionals and get top 16 or better at six of them (laughs) like yeah that's hard I think some of the gripes with the system from that aspect, though, will go away when we do get cups and challenges back next year, which I'm assuming I'm assuming we'll have cups and challenges for at least two quarters next year. Right. Quarter three, quarter four. Um, Yeah. So and they could also adjust the points like usually for winning a challenge is 15. Usually for winning a league cup, it's 50. They could adjust those points as well and go like 75 and like 30 or something. Right. So we could see an adjustment of the points. I don't think they're going to change the worlds. It would, to get the invite for Masters, it's 500 points. I don't think they're changing that. But they could adjust how much points you get from Cups and Challenges. Um, 
to kind of uh, work alongside that. Um, so I think I think the the world's invite will be a little bit more obtainable than people currently think because we will get I'm, I'm like almost positive we're getting local events back at some point next. I think year, it is right. It, I I'm pretty sure it is confirmed. I saw something even on Twitter this week where someone submitted a support ticket, and in the response of the support support ticket, the person from Pokemon said something about return to local events early 2023 so like it's 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 all but confirmed to be happening and i think it maybe is just literally confirmed to be happening at some point next year so that's probably one of the main reasons for people's kind of feeling like it's almost unobtainable or something but it's going to be i think reasonably obtainable once that comes back for a lot of people but i still think like we were even just saying like you know you go to your one regional towards the end of the year you're not even close to your invite but there's still a chance if you get if you win the tournament or if you go to show up to naic you maybe have zero championship points, but if you top eight NAIC, you could get your world's invite. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think it would still be cool to have, or just the AIC in your region, right? Uh, NAIC is just like the last major event before world. So, that'd be like your last, last chance. But it would still be cool to have that kind of as a potential option for, you know, getting an invite. That'd be like some cool storylines as well, just throughout the tournament as well. You follow a player who has zero championship points, but they're, you know, on the way to getting top eight at NAIC, and that would lead to their world's invite. That's a pretty cool. A story to have a to have a on the on the stream and all that kind of stuff so yeah i think there should be a little bit of adjustment in the system just not don't get rid of the championship points as the system but just also have like the automatic invite in there for some tournaments acquire like achieving some placement at some tournaments should just get you an invite i feel like yeah definitely so I mean, there, there's plenty that we'd like to see reworked with this system. We've talked about it before, you know, more prize money as well. There, like, there's so many things <laughs> that just need to be updated with this system. And it, it almost feels like something that they need to plan to look at it. I mean, they really should plan to look at it every year and reevaluate every single year. But, like, at a minimum, every three years or so, the system needs to have a good look and see. Like, and maybe less so if they get something that works really well and put it in place and everyone, it, it seems to think it works and um, is just fine. But like, I think it's been pretty obvious from the discourse over the last six months or so, just in general, that the community as a whole thinks that this is just not where it needs to be. It's just not where it needs to be right now. Yep. Definitely would like to see some improvement for sure. All right. I think that kind of covers everything we want to talk about this week. I was going to say a little bit of a shorter episode, but that is not true. Despite the <laughs> few less topics this time around, um, so we still find a way. Else... We we find a way to ramble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next week we're going to be talking about uh, Dallas regionals, which I believe is the only regional. Hang on, I'm looking this up before I say it. <laughs> uh, championship happening next weekend. Ooh, I'm going to check real fast, but I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. So the only tournament, or not next weekend, the weekend after next. Um, but uh, yeah, so not this coming up weekend, the weekend after that. So we'll be talking about where the format is. Uh, are the counters still viable to beat Lugia? Or is Lugia with Espeon VMAX actually just broken and actually can't be beat? Uh, so we'll be talking about that. All right, Chip, unless you got something else to cover, send us away. Yep, I think that is going to do it. Thanks so much to everyone for listening. As always, your support is so, so greatly appreciated. If you do want to go that little extra mile, we would love for you to leave a review of the podcast on whatever platform you are listening on. It takes just a second to do, and it does help more people to to discover the show, so we really would appreciate it. Also, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not, so you can always be uh, catching these episodes if you are someone who watches on the youtube channel i think like less than 50 percent of the people who watch every week are sub- actually subscribed to the channel so just click the little red button down below easy enough right and uh, yeah thanks a bunch for the support as always if you want to follow along with us uh, outside of the podcast you can best place to do that is over on twitter you can follow myself at chip richie follow azul at azul underscore gg and you can also just follow the uncommon energy podcast at uncommon underscore energy for me and azul that is going to do it and we will see you next week 7 a.m eastern tuesday morning don't want to miss it be back next week peace